from Charles Paul Gwilling tells us there. Mm -hmm. Okay. To come back to this, if we could, sure. one thing that seems to be missing from the page that might be helpful at this stepping back in, mm -hmm. in the evolution of your concepts to the story of, of the experience of building this machine and having people go through it, you haven't really said much about the alternative strategies that appeared. Aside from, we've got a nice diagram with the stringers, but what other kinds of people? Well, I've got a diagram of the stringers here, and a typical clumper there. Um, you got that, that would be a lumper. Lumper, in, yeah. In the red. I mean, he one of the guys going to end up making chords. Always does make chords. This may include a lot of fallbacks, incidentally, to making pairs. It may even include altering the pair. And this is detected by looking at the latencies and yeah, also the mistakes. Right. Okay. But this is a, these are the, you can more or less put a polar extreme here on, on them. And it's not, it, it, it's not accidental, I mean, in, in the sense that it's quite a dominant one. There are people, I say certainly, people who jump from one attitude to another. But you don't often get a, a mixture. Um, you can cite mixed types, but well, you look at the records. They're seldom, actually seldom occur. And it's pretty easy to make some sort of categorization. Um, and when I talk about a learning strategy, what I'm really anxious to get over is I mean something like that, a marking on a graph, or a number of markings on a graph. I'm not talking in any sort of hazy way about the thing. In contrast to when I talk about a learning style, which is a propensity, if you like, to adopt, has it carries with it a propensity to adopt one sort of strategy or another. And that is a much more sort of smudgy concept mm -hmm. than a learning strategy, which I take as strategy a very definite thing, mm -hmm. which is actually marked out on either a sheet of paper or some other recording material. And um, Indeed, the as uh, I think Paul pointed out, Paul, Paul Pengara points out, there is need a resemblance between the learning strategies found by Bern Scott, which were called holists and serialists, and between plumpers and stringers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not actually the same people, but there is a, you know, the same people don't do it. It's presented with a uh, conceptual type or intellectual type rather than primarily sort of motor-oriented type operation. The person who's a plumper doesn't necessarily become a holist or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the types are rather similar, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what, can you say a little bit more about the, uh, the occasions in which a person, a biological individual, might have uh, the propensity to switch from a lumper to a uh, stringer strategy, or vice versa. Under what circumstances would people do show, exhibit that? They typically do when they innovate, and uh, they have to. You see, they have. To, uh, I think when innovation occurs, um, when when you require people, I mean, the very way of doing it is to require people to create an analogy. Uh, rather than to look at an analogy that's pointed out. So I mean, I could take sort of, again, a favorite example, I believe a good example, which is, is due to, uh, I think, um, Anatole Rappaport or somebody. Uh, the isomorphism between, uh, what is it, uh, mass, uh, elasticity, and um, friction. Yeah, and uh, what is it? Um, Preston's impedance and uh, resistance. I can point out that if we take construct impedance, for example, whether it's mechanical or electrical, we can construct it in mechanics and electricity, elementary electricity, elementary AC theory, elementary mechanical theory, electricity, functionals and stuff. Uh, it, you know, by looking the same kinds of mathematics being applied and observed. 
universe of discourse different, I, uh, differing from either, in which I point out this analogy which relies upon some equation containing terms in a differential equation. I want to call it second derivative, first derivative, and so forth, and one's got no derivative. I can derive them from each other, again, in an altered way in this universe. And uh, the terms will enter in a invariant form. And the analogical universe contains mathematics. Well, there is a universe called mechanics, which contains springs and lumps of wood. There's a universe called electrics, that contains passive and resist coil conductors. And um, they have a force called gravity acting on one and have an electrical force on the other. Represented by a generator, and all we put at the beginning of the circuit. Now it's uh, in both cases I have a perturbation of some potential, so that I raise the bloody thing, or uh, or else I have a battery. And um, make the generator go round, rather. I'm sorry. And um, the, um, it is pointing out an analogy, which may be very useful. It doesn't make any difference, because I have now created outside, I made the distinctions and the similarities between the worlds. And if you're familiar with mathematical symbols, and you're familiar with mechanical things, and you're familiar with electrical things, then you don't know the rules of one of the universes, and you do know them of the other, they'd be very helpful to you perhaps to point this out, but to a large extent you can avoid a lot of labor in learning, when indeed you're just learning to apply rules which are isomorphic, uh, within certain limits, of course, mm -hmm. but there it is, that within those limits, or classical limits, it works very well. Now, this is pointing out an analogy. On the other hand, if I present you with a universe mechanics and said, look, you know, strange, there's some bits of uh, curious sort of lightning jars and um, uh, one of Mr. Faraday's contraptions uh, and uh, a piece of carbon <laughs> and tell that I can pass electrical lightning through the carbon. It gets hot. <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. I can charge this up. This piece of glass with two pieces of foil vanished over and this strange thing found in the light of the universe. I don't know what the hell it's all about you. Uh, you've got to invent, you know, an analogy when you find out how it all goes. Well, now you have to be inventing the analogy. You may not even know anything about mathematics. You might use quite a different universe to do it in. There's no reason why you should explain it mathematically. All I'm asking is you know about mechanics. You're a skilled mechanic. You've never heard of calculus. Mm -hmm. As to, I say to you, well, look, I'm assured that this gadgetry has a useful activity. It might be used in some other piece of mechanism, perhaps combined with mechanics somehow. Not necessarily. You think there's an analogy of some sort? Now he may create mathematics, or he may create, say, it's a hydraulic, and do it by working out how to make a, a special fountain. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. Equally good. I mean, for that application, it is, I guess, mathematics would go a bit further, but within the classical limits, it's equally good. I don't know. So doing that you can have a fairy story about it. It's fine. It's often used in, in presentation. And, are you uh, and you're suggesting that that's essentially a lumping process? That is, no. That is essentially a process which, if you are required to invent an analogy, will make, will make you change perspective. Uh, you ask what will, what will make a person do it. If, if you will do that, then I know that you have several coexisting perspectives and have at least one more. But just by telling you when you're familiar with all these different universes, I know that you're switching one perspective to another, but no, it's all. Uh, surely analogy construction goes along with a sort of lumping activity, very often, 
and the use of analogies goes along very commonly with I mean, I, I suspect sure. people are thinking these are analogous. But, uh, they are. I mean, uh, that's true, absolutely true. But, um, it's the use of analogies that may be there, rather than their neglect. And, and a, a, a pure character like that will actually prefer to learn all about mechanics, all about electricity, and then separate part. And then learn all about mathematics. Right. Uh, maybe not do that too well, or whatever. And you know, often the opportunity just prefers doing it that way. And there's no reason why not. Um, and that's just the right intro to where we're going. Yeah, that's that's where we want to come in because we want to do a good deal of this and so the new people will come in yeah. next week. So. Certainly for the ARI stuff, this is absolutely right on. And maybe some brief bridge Friday for Friday. We should have a very interesting group. <laughs> particular thing that we should address this afternoon. I have any particular points emerging from previous sessions? Yeah, why don't you just carry on? Well, Gordon, you suggested that at the end of the last session that we were about to sign into a very interesting apple uh, connected with your observations of subjects in the precast systems and the emergence of uh, lumber and stringer strategies but mm -hmm. that and then we got to talk about how these people shifted sometimes particularly when in one case uh, for example they were asked to form an analogy of their own well but ending with the enticing comment that uh, it was really after the sessions were over that you learned the most uh, because they began to play, and that there was a good deal to say about that. Yes, I might emphasize that during, and it is worth emphasizing, I guess, that during the official sessions, as reported, which I believe are a duration of one hour, but it's in the paper. And I can't remember exactly how long every experiment went on. They were typically sort of half hour warm up, and then hour and a half, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, excepting the deliberately very long ones, which are like the self-consistency one, which went on much longer, and the group decision, which went on all day. And um, the decision-making through a mechanical interface is a uh, mode of interaction between participants. Um, this was still precast. Uh, yes, this is all still precast. Still precast. Precast concrete. <laughs> certainly is precast. Uh, during the sort of official period of experimentation, or what would often be regarded as a, a very long laboratory training interval, there were not a long school of duty, um, and not a long real life interval, even on a sort of Elliot Jack's time span analysis, uh, you know, I'm talking about here, the Elliot Jack's has a, a measure of um, responsibility in respect to sequential tasks, essentially tasks like uh, working on a production line on, in, a, in a boiler shop where different jobs come in and are completed. And, uh, the span of unsupervised activity 
uh, varies anything from 10 minutes to several hours, uh, maybe longer even. And um, so in real life, it's not actually very long, but in the laboratory, by laboratory standards, experimental psychology would have it. These are long experiments. And some of them, that like the ones I mentioned just now, were deliberately long. Now, this one, I think, lasted, let's say, an hour and a half. I know. That's a little bit like Gregory Bateson's distinction uh, for the rat who is conditioned by uh, a shock in the, uh, in the uh, experimental situation, mm -hmm. which in the field would be absolutely near a ramble or something like that, but in a different context. He has a different, entirely different perception of the nature of this. Yeah. So here you we should be yeah, I think he's right. I, I, I'm not. I'm sure he's right. Gregory's right about most things. Was right about most things. Still is. Um, so maybe this is very. And he, 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 it is quite important. I think with the rats, as a matter of fact, the, the strangeness of an electric shock, even for human beings, uh, an aversive stimulus is uh, is very queer, very very odd. And we did an awful lot of work on uh, adaptive keyboard training using a queuing device, just a sub minimal shock. And whenever it began to give a shock, it was a touch tactile sensor, on the earliest ones to detect where your fingers were on the board. And um, it was quite difficult to keep the regulation so that the cross skin potential was not at shock value. As soon as it was, it was aversive to the extent of putting people right off. Um, and of course, if it wasn't feelable, um, it, um, it didn't work at all. <laughs> so, you know, the whole idea was maybe, as a matter of fact, the idea turned out not to be that good in the end. It was a thing to try. Uh, well, in this experiment, say it was an hour and a half, I should emphasize that during the sort of published bits, unless otherwise specifically mentioned in the paper, um, people were remarkably consistent in their behavior and their strategies they adopted and could well be classified, not dichotomously, but could well be classified into clumpers and stringers. But it was after that, mostly, that they changed perspective and uh, could alternate around. And indeed, it was one of the ploys they engaged in when uh, playing with the machine, by which I mean that they, by observation, also by report, it wasn't that their performance deteriorated so much as which it did if you wanted to uh, talk about their performance of this darn skill <coughs> of pressing keys in response to lights coming up in certain patterns and so on. It was um, that the task was different. They were now, in some sense, enjoying the system. And um, it was thinking of what they did. It was quite illuminating. And, um, can get at this, if I was talking primarily with psychologists, I think I would say that the well-known paradigm experiment uh, done by an awful large number of people on one or another sort of anticipation and choice. And the setup is as follows. Uh, there are, let us say, in the simplest case, uh, a left and a right. There is a left button and there is a right button. And situated on the left-hand side, there is, say, an uh, orange light, and on the right-hand side, a puce light. And there is also an indicator that the stimulus is about to occur. And you are told as a subject that the orange light will come on with, say, 40% probability, and the puce light with 60% probability. 0 0.46, 0 0.4, and 0, 0 0.6. Um, <coughs> indeed, every time that the um, and I suppose the immediate sort of expect stimulus light comes on shortly afterwards, uh, a stimulus light comes on. Now you're uh, told that you will receive a reward. Uh, 
um, or in some way be rewarded, depending on the variance on the same thing, for maximizing the number of occasions when you hit the right key. You're also, also told, and it's true, that there is no experimenter uh, working these lights, uh, or alternatively, the, the experimenter is working from um, dice throw. Um, usually, you're in a direct randomizing, so called machine, dice chucking machine. And um, the so called random source is turned on, and of course, uh, there are a couple of strategies, only one of which is really very successful. Um, the first one, which is not very successful. Before you, before you, you tell us that, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, but to be really clear, if I were sitting down at the machine, yeah. just run me through what I'm um, Well, this would be a trivial right? machine. It's a dice, yeah. really, but it happens to have an illuminate, uh, easier display so boards and get a response. Uh, you're predicting which side the dice will go, left or right. So I'm, I'm pressing a key before the light Before comes the light on. comes on, and you, when the, when the uh, attention light comes on, the anticipation light, the light says that a stimulus light is coming on. Before the light comes on, you, you press what you think is most likely to occur. Right. Now, you know that one, is, one side is 40% and the other side is 60%, right. say left and right. Okay. I got so it. if you were a statistician, and quite a lot of subjects are, uh, and since the throws are independent, uh, whatever that means, as a good statistician, you would uh, maximize your mathematical expectation of gain by solidly pressing one button. In fact, depending little on the circumstance, you would simply hold your finger pressed down on the right-hand key, uh, the 60% key, uh, and stay in mobile. Quite a bit boring, and sometimes it's arranged to have to waggle your hands or something. But uh, anyhow, keep on pressing this thing. If you were quite sensible but naive in the matter, you would, I guess, uh, try to match the frequencies of occurrence of the right and the left light. And there is a, a, a a tendency to to do that uh, among some subjects. Uh, both strategies are adopted typically for about five or ten minutes, and pretty obvious why the statistics one is given up because it just gets unbearably tedious. And having got the trick, you might as well say, "Well, look, I'm going to keep my finger down on this and place the bottle on it and go away. Bottle on the button and go away." and then come back and collect a reward at the end of the sequence. Um, the other one is pursued by quite a lot of people and the belief that, well, just the misunderstanding of what independent throws means of a, a dice. Uh, in other words, they've misunderstood the character of the haphazardness of the situation. I think the, you know, they make 60% responses, as it were, to the um, higher light, they're doing better. Now, uh, of course, uh, even this... Hello, John, how do you? Glad you made it. Yeah. We've just started. Just for a while. Okay. It's such a hot day, isn't it? Hot and muggy day. And, um... The, um, in this case, there is nothing inside the thing encouraging you to do much else, but even so, people, of course, begin to display what is called superstitious behavior by, by, by many schools of psychology. Before you tell us what that is, could you just step back <coughs> to what you just said about their misperception of the nature of the independence and say well, how you see their... Assessment of it they as have got to it somehow that there is a there is a tie somehow between trials, so that if if one is, is occurring, the other is less often is likely to occur less often. If there's a group of, of rights, for example, then 
it's very likely because it's a 60-40 that uh, left will come up very soon and we'll have a go at that. I'll try to match some way the frequency of occurrence of the light. And of course, well, that's the, quite typical. Well, wasn't that on the text that uh, Chen was fiddling with and talked about a gambler's fallacy? And people will just feel that if there's been a mm -hmm. run of red, there must they soon be a black. Right? So they will yeah. try to, to outguess yeah. the wheel. Of course, in yeah. roulette, it's often the case that if there's been a run of left, yeah. that there may well be a reason to do that, depending on your assessment of the honesty of the wheel keeper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. That, of course, is the problem. Yeah. They, they may fundamentally begin to believe that although you've told them they're independent, first of all, there are some people who, who don't understand the notion of independent, mm -hmm. don't really believe yeah. it, and secondly, that they may think you've lied and it's part of the experiment to determine whether or not they realize that you've lied. Well, that is the that is, 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 is indeed one superstitious behavior. That's right. yeah. Yeah, but I think there are two different notions. Yeah. There. There's one there is that they, well, there they, is they, they don't understand what independent mean, and that's the yeah. usual gambler's fallacy. Yeah. And secondly, that they may understand what independent means, but they believe you lied. Yeah. Right. And then there is the case of the imagining that really there's a wicked finagling thing behind there that's trying to outwit them. In other words, the wheel keeper is the what do you call the guy in the casino uh, is. Uh, the croupier is not, in fact, uh, in, 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 good, in good faith. He has got a, a gnome under the wheel or behind the screen, or there is a, a machine with an algorithm or something which is, is trying to learn about you, and they try to beat this uh, imagined beastie. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so now, in fact, the superstitious is simply the belief in the, the intelligent beastie or the experimenter or the intelligent machine and uh, <coughs> since it doesn't exist and really the whole thing is contrived by dice throwing or whatever it's called superstitious I guess how did, um, that, how did that manifest itself in this it goes along by curious sequences of trials where you, you can observe in these experiments people doing things that look like strategies which uh, when you ask them afterwards uh, indeed they say are ah, strategies of some sort or attempts to outwit the machine or attempts to learn what the machine is doing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case, of course, we're talking about when we get playing behavior with people, I guess you could call those degenerate kinds of play, superstitious behavior, but it's not very encouraging because uh, indeed um, the thing is unbiased and the trials are independent and uh, there is no machine. Uh, accepting a, a dice thrower. And um, so, uh, the superstitious behavior, so called, and I'm not quite sure why it's called superstitious, except I guess it, there, is a, uh, there, is, there is actually a genuine belief in, in something there, some, some intelligent being there, whether it's whoever it is. Whether it's an experimenter or a or a or a crooked, uh, crooked casino, you know. and well, that's what I agree with. Is like to be correct, and um, the um, result is that um, nothing much indeed occurs. Superstitious behavior goes on as long as the experiments continue. It changes a bit. Um, the case of a machine like this, of course, uh, there's a lot that can be done by assuming that the machine has certain properties and can do certain things, and furthermore, there's a lot you can learn about it. It doesn't happen to be a haphazard device. It can be. It can be made, be said to be haphazard. I mean, there are plenty of setups to run with. People have been, um, have suggested to them the thing as haphazard and a guessing situation of some sort. Um, and even with the simplest adaptive devices, you get into a, a stage, and this is at the end of the experiment, Paul. This is after the main period is over, as it were, when the play behavior is developed to a very large degree. The people will uh, train the machine to produce certain kind of stimuli, and uh, in a very good sense, they will train it in a rather complex manner. These are 
fairly large hierarchical adaptive controller and with a thing like that for example there's a great deal of programming or training or whatever you like to call it can be done now begin to ask at this stage what in the world is happening uh, because manifestly what was initially said to be the boundary between the subject and the machinery is no longer the boundary. Uh, the thing that's meant to be the training interface is still mechanically there in a concrete sense. It's still functionally there that it operates. It's being used for a different purpose. Well, where is the cognition going on? Well, some of it's going on in the subject but some of it's been offloaded by the subject and uh, since the machine is able to accept this offloading and to do things on the subject's behalf quite a lot of what we normally call the cognitive process which is going on and being regulated is in fact exteriorized outside <coughs> of the machinery a fortiori when you have a group of people and joint strategies are possible with a set of this kind you get very strong play-like be play behaviors. I, I wouldn't, I can't easily describe them because the subjects describe them after, afterwards in their own terms, which are often fairly complete. Uh, certainly, they agree to an activity which they usually call training the machine rather than the machine training them, uh, and um, or else uh, sending funny messages to each other in the group situations uh, and being unable of course to get through perfectly and training the interface so that it does peculiar things uh, often in a cooperative manner. Now this is what I allude to as play behavior and um, of course it goes on more or less indefinitely and some of the people who've learned in these wretched adaptive things, they begin, you get your first really interesting result, namely you get a play behavior, which if examined, uh, is play implicating one or more persons and the machine. Uh, if one person, it occurred to me horribly that really I'm thinking of two individuals stuck inside one brain, because there's only one brain there, but that brain must contain at least a couple of individuals who are doing things systematically to one, one of whom is doing things systematically to an intermediate device, and the other of whom is learning from that systematic thing. Maybe there are more than two, there are maybe 20 or 50, I don't know. But at least there are two of them. When you think about the logical situation, you know, it isn't like programming that machine where you type some stuff out on a keyboard, you're programming it by training it. Have you ever sketched this schematically? Um, this, this, what, what it would look like with the uh, two situations? What it looks it like uh, in the in terms of single person case, uh, I think I could sketch it best by um, drawing a sort of environment box okay. here. Which I was going to like. Gordon, would you prefer this on the table? Yeah, that's right. And, and a person box. It's very much the paradigm we had out when our psychi psychiatric friend was around. Um, person. Why is somebody? I'm not sure. And uh, in the context of psychiatry, I drew a couple of baubles, which I will call A and B. And uh, that these baubles are interacting with each other, which I could either draw with lines, or I think I prefer to draw them with extending the baubles, so that indeed A and B have an area of internal interaction. Okay. Please emphasize it's not a Venn diagram. Right. At a late point, uh, and there is a very good boundary here between these things.
And in fact, the machine always has some sort of comparator on here. Uh, this is meant to represent a comparator symbol, standard electronics. And um, it's always got some kind of computer uh, regulator, regulator controller. parameter adjuster and they have many levels and many of these and usually they have. And for example in that tragic reinception task there would be um, many uh, there would be eight or sixteen of those depending on a particular task variant we're talking about and uh, there would be at least a couple of levels of these to adjust their parameters and possibly to adjust the sort of computation parameter that converts a different signal into some sort of tidied up form the machine to accept. That bottom corner right is and regulator. Yeah. Regulator? Yeah. And this is in fact what is coming out of here. If you like, it would probably be more neat to put uh, this as a further input in here, this is a further input in there. Now that you think it's happening. However, later on, it in your case when you're actually many of the programs that form functionally a part of the cognitive conceptual repertoire of the person are exteriorized in the machine. And I just want to emphasize that, that it in some ways is like programming one of those. Um, in another way, it isn't. It isn't, of course, in the sense that the thing doesn't look like a programmable machine in the direct sense. It's a trainable machine. Gertrude Hendricks did the original work and it really impressed me. When she did this with horses. Oh, yeah. And she found that the horses were, she was training them, actually, they were programming her. <laughs> and, uh, this was a really amazing discovery, it's one Gregor, Gregor picked up actually. And it is a fascinating result of course, but it's quite a reciprocal thing. In a sense this is meant to be training you. Uh, but it, when you train it of course you become, so you, you use it. So there's a sort of pseudopodium from this guy coming out here, a pseudopodium from this guy coming out here, and the smudgy mix-up between them somewhere in there. And this is sort of surely influenced by the construction of the device. But it would be stupid to pretend that you can any longer localize the subject. Because the thing you're concerned about being trained, if you're interested in the, in the psychologically relevant event of somebody learning something, of course is not the skill for which it was intended to train them, pressing buttons or whatever. Uh, it's some other skill. Uh, but that other skill is fabricated on their own and is continually being modified on their own and they have learned how to beat by exteriorizing a part of their internal conversation uh, what is going on inside, uh, in, what, what is going on in their head normally inside the engine. And of course the more sophisticated it gets, and I emphasize this happens even with the simplest ones, um, it uh, happens more markedly with the more complex ones and more markedly uh, or sooner, perhaps it's fairer to say, it happens sooner <coughs> with skills that can't easily be put into the paradigm of a uh, model inside the machine for how various kinds, a class of models, uh, one at least for how various kinds of people might reasonably learn a skill such as typewriting or key punching or, or whatever, uh, tracking or prejudice recognition or simple-ish fault detection and repair, dichotomizing like strategies of one sort or another, pretty obviously agreed by everybody to be good and it's great to learn what they're in and gate or all great or something like that, something to replace it. Mm -hmm. And a certain amount of expertise is required in doing this, and not much disagreement up to that point. Um, 
nor was recognizing trajectory, so though here is much more idiosyncratic, and aerial photograph recognition is really quite difficult, quite different sort of skill. And we're now getting onto the borderline where indeed um, you can um, carry on uh, less long because really the machine is not doing what this normative agreement, which is usually not mentioned at the beginning of the experiment, is about. Namely, the, the agreement was uh, uh, the subject would perform an experiment in the laboratory. Uh, side clause. May I interrupt you? Yeah. Before we take that next step, would it be? I would very much like to hear you just describe now, in a sequence, what you see the interactions being here, because I'm particularly interested in what words you would use about the, say, the fuzzy area within mm. the machine and what's happening there. But if you could yeah, just sort of trace it's simply a joining up of these two, and it could vary anything between their complete overlap. So that this was a sausage. It could have been drawn like this. Is it well, in the wrong color? This is a sausage which could have been drawn like that. Okay, rather than the other way around and would have been better drawing, to a case in which you've got a couple of pseudopodia coming out. Mm -hmm. This is the bit shaping what's going to uh, go out, and this is the bit shaping what happens to your productions, your depressions of keys or whatever it is. Uh, to, as I say, a sausage where it overlaps completely, and you simply get an external equivalent to this internal sausage, having to draw it as a... Draw it as a I see. Uh, draw it as a four sausage diagram. It's quite illuminating to do so occasionally. Actually, there's no, I mean, there's no difference between doing that and the overlap of boxes. They're just simply a different way of doing drawing the thing. Uh, the important thing is that this is inside a head. And this is inside a thing that's meant to be a machine, even though there is the external apparatus. The appurtenance is outside of some sort of apparatus with an engine in it and so forth. And, uh, okay, that's good. And that's how I draw it. I mean, uh, can I interrupt and ask in this sure. specific example again, can you say what an, what an A and a B perspective might be? Well, Marv uses words like um, proposer and critic. So in the case of this uh, I would say teacher and trainer is probably more apt, or trainer and sorry, trainer and learner is probably more apt in this case, in the case or this experiment, how would you Joker and uh, what about the superstitious buffoon. aspect and the, and the actions that are taken? Could you say that an a might encourage your superstition? See, whereas the situation which genuinely is arbitrary doesn't in any way allow you to, or persuade you, to pull this out. In a certain sense, you create an image which can be located quite happily in here. Okay, so there are two questions. Uh, you're not just learning about the situation here. Your act of learning about it is teaching the situation, is training the situation. And this is the big difference. I don't see how that's true <coughs> in this case of the... Uh, yeah. Of flipping the switches on the lights. Instead. It isn't in the case of flipping the switches ah. on the lights. Okay. It is in the case of the experiment where you are got, have got an adaptive controller in those two papers you're looking at. Okay. Well, There's an awful lot you to, can. To clarify that further, I think we, we made a quick transition from the, yeah. uh, the uh, flipping the switches experiment to adaptive teaching machines uh, a few yeah. a while back, yeah. and it wasn't clear to me just whether any kind of play behavior emerged in the in the flipping the switches. Or not, uh, or did that only occur later in the? My, my point is, I think that you could regard um, you could regard uh, superstitious behaviour as uh, bound to be abortive, designed to be abortive, play behaviour at the beginnings. Okay. Uh, in other words, as hypotheses are produced, which are whatever else the case is going to be falsified. And therefore, there's no way in which you're actually training specifically the anything at all. I mean, you're having absolutely no effect whatever upon the engine. Uh, and um, however complicated the situation is, I can believe you get more elaborate beliefs and hypotheses the more complicated the situation. You get no, there is no way in which the things are going to be receptive to your beliefs. But it's a first stab at having a setup like this. Yeah. There's no reinforcement. Good. 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 And I uh, really want to point out it's a fairly common phenomenon, so I'm not talking about something that 
seldom occurs, it always occurs as far as I know. I've never known any guessing experiment that carried on for over half an hour does not end up in superstitious behavior. <laughs> I mean, you can say That's one of the few predictions you can make in psychology of the subject is either going to walk away, destroy the apparatus, or behave superstitiously. So let me ask again, and, uh, in the case of an adaptive experiment... First two are usually disallowed, is that, is that one of the chains, the other... Yes, yes. In the case of an adaptive experiment, what would be an example of an A and a B specifically, not just proposer and critic, but... Well, I would tend to call them internal attender and learner, or uh, finagler and uh, tester, or so, uh, trainer and... Uh, learner, but about a different skill, not so about the original can skill. Can we pick a specific uh, example? The trainer and learner about the machinery that is, is used to administer the training initially. So, what example should we take? Well, uh, let me just ask, uh -huh. if, if, uh, <clears throat> do you think, I mean, are you constructing a, a picture for us where you have a trainer and a learner about the machinery, mm -hmm. and a, another trainer and learner about the subject matter within the machinery? If yeah, you do, and there's a gradual transition from the case where you have, I think, initially, anyhow, a trainer and learner about the actual skill. Uh, this, is, however, at that stage was not the philosophy, and it, I'm saying this was pre-cast, pre-explicit conversation theory. I mean, for a long while, obviously, I'd suspect exactly what's happening. Uh, the play behavior thing was a result which was extraordinarily consistent. And uh, it had the properties you'd expect. And these experiments, I thought, it opportunity.